Hello, everyone. My name is Jacinth Howard, and I would like to wish you a happy Heritage Month. Today, I'm going to share with you my short story called Moses's Basket, which is based on the setting of St. Vincent and the Grenadines during the COVID pandemic. Moses's Basket. Keita viciously yanked her disposable mask off her face as she crossed the parking lot scouting for her sister. She turned her face skyward and winced as the pointed rays of the blazing sun poked her in the eyes. Place hat and tail. She grimaced and sniffled a little as the lavender body spray riddled along her neck wafted up to her nose. She veered to take in the panoramic view of the wide blue airport splayed out to the east instead of the honest veil gusts that she remembered. She braced herself for the cool Argyle winds. Things were so different now from what she knew. The roar of the massive turbines in the background began to fade, but she kept staring at the distant stationary aircraft she had disembarked only this morning. Air Canada ran across the starboard side in crimson calligraphy. The logo was a clear memory from years of repeatedly watching the plane scoot across the tarmac from her bedroom window. She had acknowledged it like an old friend, a tiny reassurance when she had boarded the flight that would take her away from her country long term. Now she stood rooted, hundreds of feet away from the vessel secure on home soil again. It had been six years since she set foot on the craft that delivered her to freedom a small enclosed vessel meandering on an uncertain path into the unknown. Her grandmother had set it adrift, commissioned her to Canada via Barbados at the time. Granny's steady words still pulsed through her jet-lagged brain. Kita, you have to go better yourself. Go get the masters and try to get permanent residence. I saw my friend who does work at immigration tell me. Now try no funny thing and I'm in a able. Walk straight and narrow. Do the thing properly. When you set up good, then you go come back to Aoi. Well, up to now, Mina sent for them. She sighed. No fault of hers. She was already trying hard to make ends meet, and the COVID-19 pandemic did not make things easier. She loved living in Toronto, but it was nothing like how everybody getting on. Things were worse now that day-to-day -day operation oscillated between house arrest and office shifts. She only went out for groceries and tolerated the bustling swarms of disguised faces downtown Etobicoke to fill the lonely void that awaited her in her apartment. She did not want to lose the nice little actuary job that allowed her to work from home. Not after weaving her way through a challenging finance degree over the last few years, Granny was the first to proudly announce the fruit of her labor. Eh <laughs> Big grand picnic does work a big job now. Um, will she say it name again? Mina Shana. Anyway, I something for doing money. Granny rehearsed this like an anthem to everybody in New Adelphi, long before Kita actually got the job. Kita knew this because all of her Skype calls with her sister started the same way. When she pitched the, I hope Granny do, it was met with an eye roll from Misha and some rendition of Granny's half-true, grandiose tales centering around her granddaughter's epic achievements and ending with a braggart mantra. Granny always been a mountain when calls came in, so Kita hardly got the chance to actually speak with her directly to find out how she was really doing. To make matters worse, Granny didn't really want anything to do with the Skype thing either. She says she can't hug she head with them young people thing. She tried a thing with the WhatsApp and WhatsApp call, but after she kept hanging up by accident, she says she's done with that. Memories of Granny embraced Kita like a Zephyr. The burly mountains peering down at her reminded her of how much she loved going to work the land with her grandmother. Yes, she spent most of their few hours together isolated on her self-made banana leaf island with her legs drawn tightly up under her chin, but she followed Granny everywhere. Misha had to go man the family-owned shop adjoined to their house, so she hardly ever accompanied the two of them. On a Saturday, they would wake up just as the sun climbed over the green sloping hills 
when the rooster echoed its loudest song and the cricket stopped chirping. Keita would waddle into a pair of Granny's big water boots and plod out of the house. Outside, the small agile woman waited with her head tied up, her wiry strong arms wrapped around a large bucket and a bundled up crocus bag atop her head. They would remain in the bare dusty yard until Mr. James' pickup truck rattled into the neighborhood and concluded its arrival with three swift toots. Toot, toot, toot. The old lady would babble with Mr. James all the way to South Rivers, leaving her young granddaughter to submerge herself in the silent wonder of the landscape. Sometimes, Keita sat in the back of the truck where she could watch the clouds slither across the pale blue of the sky while the army of trees on either side tried to race them to the north. Other times, Granny let her sit by the window where she craned her neck to see whether the clouds had succeeded in outrunning the trees. When they arrived in the heart of the Emerald Paradise, sequestered beside the heights of Soufrer, she would secure her banana leaf throne and watch her grandmother diligently plant, dig up water, tend to seedlings, arrange items, and harvest produce until she was tired of telling old-time stories. When Granny grew weary, she would yell, Girl, get up from there and come put the thing, thing at them in the back. Me not bring you up here sit down whole day, you know. Red ants must bite you. Back then, the girl would scramble up as quickly as her skinny long legs would allow and rush towards Granny to grab whatever she was about to throw. She scampered down an imaginary trail, carefully to dodge rocks, seedlings, and random debris on her way, barely stopping short of bursting her face. They would corral all the bounty for the day and wait for Mr. James to pick them up with their harvest and take them back home. Gita let out an aggravated sigh at the recollection. She also sighed because of the sun. She was growing impatient that Misha had really left her out here in this sun to melt. Her sister was late for everything. Even that she missed a little. She was glad to be back home, but not under these circumstances. When she had heard that Granny may have contracted COVID-19, her heart clenched in her chest. She begged Misha to make sure that it did not become public knowledge. The last thing this family needed was for mouths to run like water, spreading fear, panic, and malice. She did not know how her sister discovered Granny's condition so quickly, but she was glad that she did. She was itching to find out all the details and wanting to see, touch, and speak to Granny for herself. She had weighed the consequences in the balance. She would be forced into isolation at home for a while. That she could live with, since her sole purpose was coming to help take care of Granny anyway. Misha made it sound so urgent. Her nose still ached terribly from the test, and her perfume and sinuses ensured that she remembered. She wasn't sure that the negative test she received was triumph enough, especially considering the uncertainty that lay ahead with the elderly woman's health. Well, watch how Moses' basket comes straight back at your ass. She huffed considering that the river of life still seemed to channel on without destination and security, even with enough money to keep on living. Her freedom was found here, with people she loved in her treasured homeland, without the suffocating cityscape and the daily hyper-urban demands. Still, she could do without the sunburn. Oh, and the politics. She frowned as two older men passed by, locked in a heated discussion, about which party to vote for this term and why. How we mean she could this so long? Sweat trickled down her face, stick her down her long neck and pulled in her bosom. She sucked her teeth loudly, pushing her suitcase to the side so nobody else could trip over it, then slung her mask back over her aching nose. Nikita! Came a loud, high-pitched squeal. In the distance, she could see a slender figure sashing towards her. She squinted at the gracefully waving arm, quite certain the gold bangle sliding up and down on it would blind her. That couldn't be Misha coming. She appeared to be struggling to balance herself in a long flowing peach dress, and her sister's gait was generally more fluid. Still, there was no denying the empress locks piled high on her regal head, so it must be her. As she drew nearer, Kita understood why her sister seemed clumsier. Her belly was round and protruding, and her face glistened warmly. 
Wait. So when you bring wine, tell me. Kita stumbled backwards. Six years gone and not a howdy. Misha made a face and latched onto her little sister before either could remember the rules about keeping a six foot distance or sanitizing. You come fatter. Kita rolled her eyes, wondering when there would be a national announcement with a new line of greeting to replace that one. Me been your stand up forever. Me think you would have sung a little more Canadian by now. Just a little bit. Misha smiled wanly. Sorry to take so long. Me now come from Bayside. They say go to sap the belly. You sure it's not after the baby born you do sap him? Came the skeptical reply. Misha was thoughtful for a minute, but only responded with a smirk. She was so glad to see her baby sister after such a long time, although the reunion came with an unpleasant rationale. She hugged her again. Kita's face grew a little quizzical. Her big sis was not the emotionally expressive type, although they had been apart for so long. Must be the hormones. She did not know how she could not tell over Skype that Misha was pregnant. She hid it well. Her belly was low, so it was probably a boy if all wives' tales held true. Unless it was that she was nearing delivery. Anyway, she would question her sister about that later. For now, she needed to address the matter at hand. Be glad to see you, Mish. You look the same, except your face fat, and it's two, you know, instead of one. You could have tell me I was going to be an auntie. I wanted to surprise you, Misha crossed her. Yeah, you shot me hello. I'm really happy for you, though. No wonder you tell me, come. You must be need so much help around the house now, especially now that Granny not doing so good. Misha's eyebrows knitted and she pursed her lips. Yeah, she pushed her palms into her back to support it, then locked down. Me go I need plenty help for truth. What happened? Me hope none of what this man is the father. He left you. It's who? Tell me so me could back him. Boy, granny must be real vexed when she find out. You know she believe in marriage before carriage, boys before books, all that. A little laugh bubbled up in Kita as she remembers granny's old quips. Still, she knew very well that this great grandchild was about to become the favorite of all. Granny moved mountains for her descendants, and this one would not be any different. It was only a matter of time before she was laying down, laying him down in a basket too, and whisking him off somewhere abroad, telling him to go and better himself. Keita noticed Misha's silence when her own laugh ended its melody and was not met, met with equal mirth. Misha rubbed her toes on the concrete and shifted her foot back and forth. Keita shrugged. Must be the hormones. Still, she chose to grin again at the thought of Granny's delight with another baby around. So how Granny do anyway? She couldn't wait to hear what her grandmother had found interesting in now. Still, she braced herself for the typical, she got a mountain response, knowing the old woman was going up there to find some cure or usefulness, knowing that Granny would pretend that she was well and strong even when she wasn't. Knowing that Granny can't keep still on a bed for more than five minutes. Misha raised her head and looked at her sister, squarely in the eyes. Kita thought she could see tears escaping down her sister's usually nonplus face. Nikita, her voice wobbled. Granny gone. Kita's face contorted. She listened again, waiting for Misha to finish the sentence with a mountain. Granny dead Kita this morning self.